Hello, everybody. Hello. About 10 miles down the shoreline uh, is a place called Makaha. It's a small town, a village, you could say. Uh, for the past 85 years, the waters and the land there has sustained five generations of my family. Yeah. And when you live in a community like that, every other house is family. Yeah. And I wanted to share that with you and tell you this story before I begin. You can step out of my house, throw a rock, and you can hit the civil defense siren. Okay? And I'm kind of happy about what I heard earlier today because I can go back to my family after all these years of being raised next to a civil defense siren and tell them, we can adopt it. <laughs> yeah? And, and in my mind, I'm thinking what my father's going to say next. And he's going to say, do we have to feed it? <laughs> Crazy. Wonderful idea. And I want to share a story about our community there that our family belonged to. When Japan had that unfortunate earthquake, we had the tsunami warning here. So 2 o'clock in the morning, here goes the siren right outside the house. And, you know, and, and we're so used to those sirens living there so long uh, for hurricanes, tropical storms, tsunamis, that it's already uh, ingrained in our family that it's the younger generation that goes finds out why the sirens are going off. <laughs> yeah, because all, all of us is just like rolling over with the pillows over our heads, going ah, ah. You know, my father's like, unless it's planes, don't tell me. <laughs> you know, and um, so one of the nieces come in and say, it's a tsunami. So the first word comes out of one of the, the elders is, how long? This is about four to five hours. And that tells you that doesn't give us much time. But this is what happens on the west side when you have a tsunami warning, is the family gets into gear, and everybody, the, the elders start getting on the phone, and they start calling everybody. Not to tell them that a tsunami is coming, but to remind them what their responsibilities are. So you call in Uncle Joe and his sons to go up to the evacuation point to make sure that they clear the area so it's safe for when the children get there. Yeah? You call in several of the aunties to make sure that they start cooking the rice, not the small pot, but the big pot. <laughs> yeah, the one that the whole bag goes into. <laughs> and every West Side family has them. <laughs> right? And um, so you got to go under the house, pull that pot out, wash it, make sure you have propane so you're going to cook rice. Somebody got to cook beef stew. Somebody got to cook chili. Somebody got to cook patele stew. Somebody got to cook all this. So every family in the neighborhood has an assignment. Somebody got to go to 7-Eleven uh, and make sure we get all the ice. Not for food, but for the beverages. Okay? Because what we're planning for is not to go to a shelter and wait this out. We're planning a huge social event. Yeah? Because... You know, that's what a tsunami is. It's an excuse not to go to work, an excuse to have a social event. So we're all driving up to the valley as high as we can go, where we, we know where to go, cleaning it up. Some families putting up the tents. The other families bringing the chairs and the tables. Yeah? And then we start coming. We also have to send the young ones to get the elders that live by themselves whose families might no longer be in the village anymore. So you have Uncle Joe. Right? And every time you tell the kids, go get Uncle Joe, they're like, oh, why I got to get him for? Because Uncle Joe, the first thing you tell him is, Uncle, tsunami warning. He's going to say, burn the siren. <laughs> right? And then he says, I lived here for 80 years, and the water has never come to my house. <laughs> Look, you see any salt on my grass? Right? And the young ones, because the old people don't want to deal with that, so you got to send the young ones. Right? And the young ones are like, uncle, we got to go. Come on. Right? And then it's always the, the clinch is, auntie making patele stool. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> right? And then everybody goes up. You're at the evacuation site, overlooks the entire Makaha Beach, and every so often you hear somebody go, did it come yet? And everybody goes, No. You know, and then by five or eight hours into the event, music going, everything happening, um, we forget why we're there. 
Yeah. And everybody, it's, you guys are going to love it because you know it's happening and it's true. Everybody goes, oh, we got to stop meeting like this, see each other more often, you know. Oh, look, he's, oh, your baby grown. Yeah. But it's so interesting that how we as a community can come together so quickly, yeah, and make the best of a bad situation. Isn't that true? Yeah. You know, my ancestors a long time ago in these islands when they came, they lived in villages, yeah? Clusters of families in villages from the mountain to the sea, okay? And in those villages, they all had its, each village had its own gift. The fishing village, the hunting village, the farming village, the healing village, the warriors. Each village had a purpose to sustain the whole. Every house in each village had a gift. Every individual in that family had a gift. All of that to sustain and defend the village. Yeah. And whenever there was an offense between one another, there were systems of relationship building that was in place so that the balance of the gifts can be maintained for the betterment of the village. Yeah. And when the offenses was, became too great that the village couldn't handle it, areas were created outside of the villages that we called sanctuaries. And the gifts were sent to the sanctuaries to hang out, stay there a while, deal with the issues. And when they were ready to return, the community embraced them, yeah, because the gift has returned. And they immediately fell back into their role to sustain and defend the village. Every crime is preceded by a choice. Every choice comes from an experience. Every experience comes from an individual journey. And every journey comes from a place all too familiar, an environment that we all know and that we all call home. Home, what was once a safe place, has become a complex, has become a place with complex social dynamics. Yeah? In most recent times, it has produced both the victim and the predator. It has produced the best of who we are and the worst of who we are. It is a heavenly place. It is a place of hell. Abuse in our family homes is a national statistic. It is something we cannot speak about. It is our biggest embarrassment, our biggest shame. It is so bad that life in that home for any individual starts with a journey of rebellion that leads to a search for substances to ease the pain and then entrance into the criminal justice system. We have forgotten how to be a village because we don't need nobody to take care of ourselves. We drive to work by ourselves. We don't need nobody. I don't need you to feed myself. I don't need you to take care of my house. It is the way we are today. We don't need our neighbors. When offenses are committed today, we take the gift and we send it away. And when they return, they're ignored and they're shunned a gift no more. You know? The government has tried for so long to stem an increasing prison population. The public's expectation on the government to solve the problem is way too high. The task is overwhelming. Public organizations with their concern for community and its members <clears throat> are more 
concerned with trying to sustain their organization than their mission. The task is too overwhelming. Can prisons be a place of healing? seen in the yellow shirts are members of Wellspring Covenant Church. Their gift is compassion. Compassion for children of incarcerated parents. They come so many times during the year to provide a venue for a mother and a child to be together for a bond. Yeah, to maintain the familial bond during incarceration. Yeah. Their goal to stop intergenerational incarceration. Stronger children, stronger families for a better community. It is a wonderful gift that they bring to the Women's Community Correctional Center. And as I stand here before you, I want to share with you that the Women's Community Correctional Center has a gift that we also have defined. It is a gift of attraction. And what we do is that we attract gifts Gifts from the community, organizations and volunteers that can bring to us substance abuse treatment, mental health issues, family counseling, parenting, child care, vocational skills, spirituality, culture. They come on their own so that they can touch and reignite a gift to put back into the community. The mission or the vision of the Women's Community Correctional Center is to transform lives. Yeah. And I've left it like that for a purpose. For when they come into the facility to touch these women and to help them in their journey, they realize that the women still have their gifts. And a magical thing happens and an exchange takes place. And the volunteers are, and organizations are actually touched themselves. It's a two-way touch. So that when they leave, they themselves become transformed. And they remember how it used to be when we cared about each other. Because when you send a volunteer that's been transformed within a correctional institution back into the community, the opportunities for that community to change and transform is even greater. 
Government agencies, public agencies, they all have gifts. But we have to figure out how we are going to bring them together strategically yeah, so that we can have collective impact on a criminal justice system. Creating places of healing is, me is, is merely a gathering of gifts of people who care. Yeah. Can family court be a place of healing? Can the juvenile detention center be a place of healing? Can divorce court be a place of healing? I'm going to say yes. Yeah. We have to change our way of thinking from modalities of punishment to modalities of transformation and change. And only then can we have a better tomorrow. Yeah. In a new urban city, places of healing, we can be a village again. Thank you.